Okay. Um, so I did assign a new project last time, so I'll get the due date on it. It requires that you, uh, so it's on the lecture site with the assignment. Um, it requires that you install some additional software in Octave and or MATLAB. So there's some instructions on my website for doing that, but you probably want to try and do that. It doesn't take long to install, so you want to make sure it installs uh, correctly. Don't wait until when the due date is on the next project, but don't wait until the night before and then find out you can't install it. Have trouble installing the software because then you won't be able to do the uh, project. Okay, so. Um, we've talked about stability in the past, so in terms of the impulse response, um, we want to talk about it today in terms of the transfer function, and we also want to talk about uh, what it means to be uh, invertible, to have an invertible system, and then we'll also bring up um, the frequency response and finding a response to actually sinusoidal signals. So we looked at that previously with the, with the frequency response. So um, what's the difference between the frequency response and actually the transfer function with regard to um, sinusoidal signals? So stability and so uh, our previous definition was that our, still our current definition, that a bounded input led to a bounded output. That was our definition of a stable system. And we looked at what that meant from an impulse res response trans, um, uh, from an end. We looked at that from the point of uh, the restrictions on the impulse response. It had to be absolutely integrable. It had to have a finite integral over the absolute value um, I'm going to talk about it in terms of the transfer function. In order to do that, you need to talk about um, whether or not the transfer function is, is proper. And so, most of the transfer functions we are working with can be written in this form. Rational function of polynomials in S. If there's a delay, it's all multiplied by an exponential term, and e to the minus 2s would correspond to a time delay of 2. But there's typically a rational function part like this. So we assume here that the numerator is of order m, so it has m zeros or the highest order, the highest coefficient. Uh, and S is M, so S to the fourth, that'd be a fourth order, and M would be four. And N is the order of the denominator, so we have N poles. So some definitions, if M is less than N, uh, we call that, we say the rational function is, is strictly proper. If M is equal to N, it's proper. And if M is greater than N, it's M proper. And remember the M greater than N case, actually the M equal N case is where we're doing the inverse Laplace transform. Uh, we have to do that synthetic division. And, uh, we can't do a, we can't do a partial fraction expansion unless it's uh, strictly proper. But from a stability standpoint, if M is greater than N, I'm sorry, M less than N, or M is equal to N. So if it's proper or strictly proper, and the poles are in the left half of the S plane again. So our, our poles here are. The zeros of the denominator, they can be complex, they may be real, but if they have a negative real part, that puts them in the left half of that S plane. 
So our condition for stability is that if M is less than N or M is equal to N, so it's, it's either strictly proper or proper, and the poles are in the left half plane, the system is stable. If M is greater than N, it's improper, it's unstable. It doesn't matter where the poles are in that case. And so we'll, we'll, look at, we'll look at a couple of examples. So H of S is 2 over S plus 3 squared plus 2 squared. If I, I completed the square there, if I wrote that as a second order polynomial and the, and the denominator and correspond to actually having a, a complex conjugate pair of poles. Now, is this proper, strictly proper, improper? What's the order of the denominator? Yeah, it's a second order polynomial. What's the order of the numerator? It's a zero order. Uh, so it's it's the strictly proper case. So we just need to determine whether the where the poles are are at. So call the two poles S1 and 2. They would be at minus 3 plus or minus J2. And again, what I mean by that, here's our real axis, here's our imaginary axis. You know, back negative three along the real axis, and then plus or minus two units. So this would be a graph of the pole locations for this system, um, you know, in the complex plane. Here the poles are in the left half of the complex plane. That really just means they have a negative real part. The poles have a negative real part. That actually leads for the impulse response to decaying exponentials. But this is all we need to know now looking at the transfer function. That it's a bounded input, bounded output system or a stable system. If we did the inverse Laplace transform of this, we'd actually get a sinusoidal, a sinusoidal signal, but with a decaying amplitude. This has, I'm not going to go through it, but this is finite. You can integrate that sine, absolute value of sine is, is always less than one. So it's going to be bounded actually by the integral of e to the minus 3t. But it's a finite integral. So, um, so it satisfies that definition. And I think that's actually equal to three. A squared plus one over s. Um, it's the order of the numerator here, it's two, the order of the denominator is one. So is it proper, strictly proper, improper? It's improper. So it's unstable. It doesn't matter where the pole, where the poles are. I should mention here that the poles have to be in the left half plane. They can be they can't even reside on this axis. If the poles are on the axis, that gives us actually a sinusoidal term in the impulse response. It doesn't decay, and that's, that's unstable. Now, now here, you can show that the uh, impulse response, well, actually, uh, if, x of t is u of t, which is a bounded input. x of s is 1 over s. y of s is the product. 
So that would be S squared plus one over S squared, or one plus one over S squared. We'll have to do that division before we do the partial fraction expansion. Or the corresponding Y of T is actually delta T plus T U of T. But here's a bounded input, a unit step, never rises above some level. But both the terms in the output response actually are unbounded. I put a threshold at any level, both the impulse and the SRAM function both will cross that threshold eventually. So again, it agrees with our definition previously of has to be a, a bounded, uh, bounded output in response to a bounded input. Now, notice the two, I can still analyze unstable systems. Using all the approach, using Laplace transforms, using convolution. Our only requirements are that the system be linear and then time invariant. It can be stable, it can be stable, it can be unstable, it can be, doesn't matter whether it's causal or non-causal. I just have to it just has to be linear and time invariant to us uh, in order to uh, apply the techniques we've learned so far to calculate the output. Any questions on this? So what does it mean to have uh, for a system to be invertible? What, th what that means is that, you know, if we have some sort of system with impulse response H of T and produces output Y of T. Well, uh, can we take that output and run it through another system to produce the original input? And if so, the system is invertible. And there are a lot of times we want to do this inverse system. If um, often we run into systems that are in the signals that are distorted, like audio signals that might be distorted or video signals that might be distorted, usually unintentionally, but if they're transmitting a signal over a long distance, we can get distortion. In some cases, it's possible to add a filter at the reception point that undoes the distortion, it's kind of the um, inverse of whatever the transfer function of our distorting system is. Um, in the S domain, if H of S is Y of S over X of S, and we want G of S. G of S similarly will be the output over the input. And this looks a little strange because normally I call my output Y, okay. but here the output is my original input signal for the invertible system. Um, but this is one over HS. So to the transfer function of the inverse system is just one over the reciprocal of uh, H of S. So what that means is if H of S is a rational function, G of S is D of S over N of S. So, but if you look back at these conditions on proper and improper systems, and with regard to stability, we also want our invertible system to be stable. The only way we have that is if H of S is proper. If it's strictly proper, its, rec it's reciprocal will be improper, right? If the order of the numerator is less than the order of the denominator, strictly proper, H of S meets that uh, restriction. G of S is the reciprocal 
So for g of s, the order of the numerator would be greater than the order of the denominator, and that would be an unstable system. So the only case in which we can have a, an, a stable invertible system is if h of s is proper, that the numerator and denominator are of equal order. Um, there is another restriction. Even when it's proper, the poles have to lie in the left half plane. Well, the poles of the invertible system are actually the zeros of our original system. Because the poles of G of S are the zero are the zeros, roots of N of S, which are the zeros of H of S. So if we want our invertible system to be stable, H of S has to be proper. <coughs> And the poles of H of S have to be in the left half plane. That's necessary for H of S to be stable. But the zeros of H of S also have to be in the left half plane for the inverse to be stable. Okay, for H of S to be stable, the zeros can be anywhere. But G of S, the invertible system, is the reciprocal of H of S. So this would be an example of a stable system because the poles are in the left half plane. Actually, in order for it to be proper, I have to have the same number of poles as zeros. It would also be an example of uh, an invertible system whose inverse is also stable because the zeros are also in the left half plane. Okay, find your, your transform sheet. H of T is equal to delta T minus 2 e to the minus 3 T U of T. I'll give you a few minutes. Find the Laplace transform of that. Combine fractions if you need to. Let's put it in the form of a rational function. And then find the inverse system. <laughs> okay, so what's the Laplace transform of an impulse? One, and then this is two over s plus three. So we need to put it over a common denominator, s plus three over s plus three. Minus 2 over s plus 3. So that's going to be s plus 1 over s plus 3. Okay. 
is this a stable system? Okay, it's proper, would be okay if it were improper, the numerator were just a constant. Uh, what else do we need to know to, the, to make sure that it's stable? The pole location. Where's the pole here? Negative three, s equal to negative three. So it's a real pole, it's in the left half plane. Um, the inverse system, is it going to be stable? Yeah, because the zero here is at negative one. So g of s, which is one over h of s, would be s plus three over s plus one. Its pole is located at s equal to minus one, where the zero is located uh, for h of s. So it is stable also. If we want to find the uh, inverse transform, It's one plus two over s plus one. So g of t, the impulse response of the inverse of this system would be delta t plus two e to the minus t u of t. Uh, notice that g of s times h of s has got to be equal to one. So if you take that product back into the time domain, that multiplication in the S domain becomes, becomes convolution. So that means G of T convolved with H of T has to be equal to delta T. I'm not gonna go through that to prove it, but it might be a good exercise. If you use your convolution table and convolve this with that, you should get delta T. That's another you know, consequence of you know, an invertible system having an, uh, an invertible system, H of T and G of T. What convolved with X of T gives me X of T, it's Delta T. Only when I convolve X of T with Delta T do I get X of T, which means that this cascaded system here or series system, the overall impulse response would be H of T convolved with G of T. That has to be equal to delta T. It's exactly the same as saying H of S times G of S is equal to one for the, for the inverse system. Okay. Um, Let's talk a little bit about must be talking loud enough, I guess. I mean, where are those things? There's that better? Did you hit record? I did hit record, but I'm not sure how well I was being picked up on that. The microphone on the camera. So uh, we want to look at. Um, we can certainly solve for the output uh, due to sinusoidal input uh, using Laplace transforms. We've also talked about finding the output due to sinusoidal inputs using the frequency response. So uh, what's the difference? So if you recall. Our frequency response, we could get by carrying out this integral. This is the frequency response. This is also h of omega, it is also the Fourier transform of h of t. We haven't really talked about Fourier transforms yet, but that's true. Now, this is very similar to our Laplace transform definition. There's a slight difference. One is the limit on the integral here is zero to infinity instead of minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus st dt. And this is what we call a transfer function.
for causal systems, H of omega is for a causal system, remember H of T is zero for T less than zero. So I can change the lower limit here. So this is for any practical system. I can change the lower limit to, to H of T. But now that's the same integral. If I just replace S with J omega. So take my transfer function, as long as the system is called, if I, I take my transfer function, the S domain function, and replace S with J omega, I've got, I've got the frequency response. Okay. So let, let's take a look at what that means. And take a look at the, the similarities between, and also the, the differences between Laplace transforms and, and ultimately Fourier transforms. So let's assume I'm going to use a, a really simple system. Okay, H of S is one over S plus two. And I want to find the response to X of T is cosine of 2t. Okay. Well, st strictly speaking, I couldn't find the response using the Laplace transform approach. I don't know how to do the Laplace transform of x of t because it exists for t prior, prior to t equals 0. You can find in my table, you, you, you can find cosine 2t ut but you won't find the Laplace transform in our table of cosine 2t. But we could use the frequency response approach to find, to find the output to, to this. And then we'll look at what, what we get using the Laplace transform in response to cosine 2t ut and, and talk about the similarities and, and differences. But in, in the book, he calls this an everlasting input. So, and this is one of the differences actually between the Fourier transform and the Laplace transform. The Fourier transform is over all time. You know, our Laplace transform, we're, we're just finding the response for t greater than uh, zero. So h of j omega, I just substitute in j omega for s. Now the frequency of my input is omega is two. The frequency of my input is two radians per second. That's this part right here. So h of j2 is one over j2 plus two, or that's going to be, I factor out of two, and the magnitude of that is the square root of two. And then the angle is minus 45 degrees. The angle of the denominator is 45 degrees, but the overall angle is the angle of the numerator, which is zero minus the angle of the denominator. So it's actually one over e to the plus j45 because we needed minus j45. So that means. Uh, y of t would be 1 over 2 square root of 2 cosine of 2t minus 45 degrees. Okay. So it'd be lowered amplitude, so this, this system actually attenuates this input. And then there's a phase shift between the output and input. So if I were looking at these two signals on the oscilloscope using two channels, looking at both signals, one would be shifted 45 degrees with relative to the other, and then the output would be smaller in amplitude as well.
Okay, um, let's use the Laplace transform to find the response to x of t cosine of 2t u of t. So I can use the Laplace transform for this. I can look up the Laplace transform of this in my table. It's s over s squared plus 2 squared, and h of s was given. It's 1 over s plus 2. So y of s is h of s times x of s. That's going to be s over s plus 2, s squared plus 2 squared. Okay. Any questions on any of those steps? So the, the partial fraction expansion would be <clears throat> using our earlier terminology. This is strictly proper. Um, and then uh, using a2 plus a3 over s squared plus 2 squared. The, the, the poles are at that term are plus or minus j2. Okay. So the poles there uh, for x of s actually lie on, uh, of x of s actually lie on the, on the imaginary axis. I'm not going to go through the, I'm just going to give you the results here. A1 is, I have minus one quarter. A2 is one quarter. And A3 is one half. So I can write Y of S as minus one quarter e to the minus. Minus one quarter, one over s plus two, plus one quarter s over s squared plus two squared, plus one half over one over s plus two squared. Now looking at my table of transforms, this matches, um, actually the, the sign term, but I need, if I've got an s plus omega zero squared in the denominator, I need an omega zero in the numerator. So I'm just going to do a little algebraic trick. Multiply and divide by two. So I get it in the right form. So now I can find the inverse Laplace transform and, and find the response of the same system to that signal. Now, this is a different signal, right? I, this one is one that I've turned on at t equal to zero. Here, this signal has been on forever. So that's this term, and then I get plus one quarter. This is the cosine term, cosine 2t u of t plus one quarter sine of 2t u of t. Um, I can combine these two sinusoids because they're at the same frequency. The, the phasor for the first one would be one quarter at an angle of zero. The sine I have to write as cosine 2t minus 90 degrees. So that's minus j one over four. But that becomes um, one over two square root of two at an angle of minus j forty five degrees. So putting it all together, I get y of t 
is minus one quarter e to the minus two t u of t plus one over two square root of two cosine of two t minus 45 degrees u of t. If we compare the two, you'll see that there's a big part of it here that are similar. Okay. The other part here, if you look at this, this is a decaying exponential. It's going to die away pretty quickly. You know, if you actually apply this signal, you're probably not even going to see this on your oscilloscope. It's just going to be gone because it goes to zero as t increases. Right? It doesn't repeat. So this is what we call the, the steady state response. And then the other part is um, the transient response. Now, you know, in, in the real world, we don't really have everlasting signals, right? We've got to turn this thing on at some point. And when we do, we would see the transient response. But often, that is not as important as the steady state response, right? This thing's going to die away pretty quickly. And certainly using the frequency response was a lot easier than using you know, the Laplace transform technique. And the Laplace transform kind of gives me everything, the complete picture, the transient response and the steady state response. But if I'm just interested or primarily interested in the steady state response, I could use the, the frequency response or Fourier transform approach. So we'll talk more about this next time. It's usually in your differential equations class, you have some other terminology that you like a, a particular solution, a homogeneous solution, um, transient steady state. Um, what are some of the other terms? Um, zero input and uh, um, oh, I can't think of the other term. Zero input and zero state responses are another way to break this is another way to break the output expression down and they all kind of give you the same result so we'll talk about that on friday so that's it for today yeah. Yeah, other